Matthew chapter 3, we will look at verses 1 through 3. I just thought we would stop there because the message here is very clear and I want to make it clear to you what John is intending to do here. So, we have an interesting character here in the Bible that I really, really love to read about. Him and probably the next guy would be uh, the Apostle Paul, right? These two, I think, are very similar. And, and, and these guys just were very bold and straightforward, and I'm kind of like that. And so I can kind of relate to them. And, and so as we go through these scriptures, don't be offended uh, from the Word of God, but embrace it and hear it and apply what is applicable to your own life. A person who happened to be listening to Dwight L. Moody, who was a very famous preacher, was very critical of his grammar. And he had reprimanded him uh, severely. And this is what Moody said I wish my grammar were better. I wish I had a better education, but I am using all the grammar I have for the glory of God. Are you doing as much with yours? Isn't that a beautiful quote? I like it personally because I know I struggle with grammar and and pronouncing words exactly. One of the words that I have struggled with, and I'll probably get it right because my granddaughter's worked with me on this, is aluminum. Did I get it right? Yeah. So she's done a good job. But there are those that have critical minds that focus on the non-essentials, that focus on grammar. I I see all these Facebooks. It's then, not then. You know, and they try to share with you how you use the words in context and so forth. You know, and we're always looking at those things when we are not looking at the essential, which is getting the gospel out. How are you doing with that? How are you doing that? Or are you a critical person just always looking, always nitpicking, always trying to find something? Or do you look beyond that and say, hey, let's get busy with reaching uh, people for the gospel. Let's get busy serving in the kingdom of God. I, I like that about a person. So what we have here this morning is a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Strange guy, and we'll see next week uh, his attire, which is camel's hair, eating honey out in the wilderness with locusts. You know, very lonely man, but yet a powerful man. Let me give you some background uh, to this point here. There's a time gap of about 30 years between chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Matthew. Uh, Matthew is silent on what happened between those years concerning Jesus Christ. Matthew's gospel skips over Jesus' childhood and adolescence. You find those stories in Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 49. We get a little glimpse of Jesus uh, when he was at the age of 12 years old, and they're serving, actually ministering uh, in the temple to older individuals. He was a very unusual little boy. Uh, from the birth story, Matthew uh, directs, directly moves to introduce Jesus' ministry. And so he skips quite a few years and he comes to John the Baptist and then right into the ministry of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 3 recounts that preaching of John the Baptist. Now you'll find in Mark chapter 1, Luke chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 12, Uh, give the same account of John the Baptist concerning Jesus. John the Baptist is listed among the Old Testament saints. He was one of the last Old Testament prophets. If you were to look at the Old Testament prophets, you could come right up until the point of John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Christ. It ended at that point, and Christ took, in a sense, the baton and the ministry from him. Jesus said that there was no greater man than John the Baptist. Uh, That's a lot to say about a man, especially coming from Jesus Christ. Uh, John must have uh, uh, impressed Jesus uh, very much. So if you remember in chapter 1, we saw the genealogy of the king. In chapter 2, we saw the infancy of the king. And here in chapter 3, we see the announcement of the king to the Jewish people. Let me break this chapter up for you. 
verses 1 through 12, we have John the Baptist preparing the way for the Lord. Today we'll look at the call of John. In verses 4 through 6, John the Baptist is preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And then 7 through 12, John reprehends the Pharisees and, and Sadducees, the religious leaders. And he does that very well. Uh, by the way, I, I like the way that he does and he stands his ground. And by the way, we do need John the Baptist in the church. Not everybody can be a John the Baptist, but we should embrace those that are bold, that can get out there and tell the world, you know, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that Jesus has already come and he's already prepared the way and you just need to receive him as your Lord and Savior. And we need those bold people. Uh, we shouldn't be offended by them. That's a rare gift that we see in the church. We want someone that's loving, someone that's gentle, someone that can caress, someone right into the kingdom of God sometimes. And that's not necessarily how people get saved. I know I was just slapped right in the face when the Lord saved me. He immediately in Matthew chapter 5, and we'll get there one day, immediately just said, you're a sinner and you're dying and you're going to hell. And I knew it because Greg Laurie was so clear with the message. And so at that moment, I knew that God was righteous in his judgment on me. And then Greg offered the, the love and the grace and the mercy. And boy, did I accept it because I was ripe for that. And so we need those John the Baptist. Please don't discourage them. Encourage them to get out there and preach the gospel message. And then in 13 through 17, John uh, baptizes Jesus Christ there in the Jordan. So let's look at the call of John. So Matthew goes directly to the ministry of John the Baptist, who was preaching there in the wilderness of Judea. Verse 1, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Or a better word might be used, John the Baptizer, because that was his ministry, baptizing those who had repented from their sins and were turning to God. And he was preaching or proclaiming, in the Greek it may be hurling, a message. He was throwing it out there, and in the Greek it suggests that it was John doing this in an extreme way as he was preaching that message. Uh, you can kind of get a picture of a, a street preacher who's on the corner of the street, and he's yelling at people to repent from their sins, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that kind of attitude that John was having here. And he was out in the wilderness. Now, his name in the, in the Greek means Jehovah is a gracious giver. I love that. It fits John perfectly. God had given him a, a wonderful gift, and John took that gift, and he used it to the best of his ability. John the Baptist was the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth. We find that in scriptures. Zechariah was one of the many uh, politically unimportant men who served in the temple. Uh, usually two weeks out of the year, he did his time in the temple serving the people, uh, serving the Lord there. And then the rest of the time he went back home, probably had a little vineyard of some sort out in the country, and he served there. Could be very well that he was preparing John uh, for that ministry, being of the Levitical uh, priesthood. Later we'll see that by order of Herod and Tychopas, uh, John was cast into prison and then we know the story, hopefully uh, some of you may know the whole story about his beheading and how that all took place. Matthew calls him the Baptist or the baptizer, one who administers the rite of baptism. But more than baptizing, John was heralding a message in the wilderness and by wilderness it means not necessarily a desert like some of your translations might say it wasn't just sand you know and wind blowing it, it, what it's suggesting is there was no one out there there were no shepherds there were no sheep. There, there was vegetation but he was alone and, and people were coming to see this man someone said that if you uh, catch on fire yourself people will come and see you burn you know, and so he was one of these guys that people were talking about and people wanted to hear, and so they came out to hear what he had to say. I love those guys. There's those, those guys that just, they have something to say and they say it well and, and people are intrigued by it and they, they immediately rush to hear uh, those individuals and eventually uh, they get caught themselves and become believers in Christ Jesus. It was there that he was preaching in the wilderness. Now speaking of preachers, there's a dramatic story concerning the life and influence of King George the, George the Fifth. In the later years of his reign, 
It was his custom to broadcast Christmas messages to the entire world. And during one of these broadcasts, as he had the ear of many people, something happened with the machine that was broadcasting him. One of the wires had broke. And so immediately they were rushing to try to fix it, uh, correct the situation. Some individual came up and suddenly they took the wires and they touched them with their fingers and the broadcast continued to go out. And so he just stood there the whole time holding on with his hands uh, the cables, the live cables, so that the message could go out to the whole world, including the United States. And the voice of the king passed through the body of this engineer. And in the broken connections of our world that we see, how can the word of the Lord be heard unless it passes through a preacher, unless it passes through a believer? The world is looking for answers. The world is right to hear them. And it is up to us to have those answers for the world. The God, is, God is pleading with us to be equipped for the work that he's called us to. And to preach the gospel message to the lost world that are dying in hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands in the world today. You are a preacher by word and also by deed. It's not just for the man who stands up here, but it's for all of us to be salt and to be light to the world. Paul said it so well. He had a situation where they were questioning uh, his authority, his ability and so forth. And he was writing to the Corinthians and he told the Corinthians that they were his letters. They were his evidence of his apostleship. He says, you are letters and men read you. And that is so true. Men read us. They look at us. They observe us. And they watch us and how we live. And they read who we are. So if we're proclaiming that we are believers in Christ Jesus, and if we're not living like believers, then they see that in us. And so how important it is that we measure up to the standard of God. So this baptizer came hurling a message in the wilderness. And he said in verse 2, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now we're going to spend a little time here because we want to look at the word repent. Uh, The word repent there, the mood that normally expresses a command in the Greek. And so it is a command. It's not a suggestion. It's not if you feel like repenting. No, you have to repent in order to enter the kingdom of of God. And so it is a action that you take as a person in order to enter the kingdom of God. John could very well be mistaken for one of uh, the Old Testament prophets like Jeremiah, who, who was out there preaching a message of judgment upon a people that just would not listen. We just saw this last Sunday that, uh, that he had to literally wear a yoke on his shoulders and had to get out there and let them know that they were going to be brought into bondage lest least they repent and God would then turn from uh, this action that he was going to bring upon them. But they would not repent because they listened to the false teachers that were out there saying that that's not true. God's judgment is not coming on the world. And so Jeremiah was one of these guys that would preach his heart out but never see, never see a conversion. They call them the weeping prophet. And what a life and what a ministry. Or Ezekiel, who had to do all kinds of strange things in order to get the message out for the Lord. And so John is out there preaching a message of repentance. John's stern and bold preaching can remind us of these Old Testaments. Uh, They too have condemned sin and called God's people back to a way of holiness, just like in the New Testament. There are some differences, though, with John in the Old Testament. One is his sense of urgency. John's sense of you need to repent now because you don't know what tomorrow brings. And scripture is clear on that. We don't know what tomorrow brings. We don't know what tomorrow uh, will bring for us as individuals, whether we live or whether we die. Only God knows that. We can be gone in a moment, an accident, a situation. So there's a sense of urgency in John's message. There's a certain sense that we need to make a decision now. And then also a sense of personal responsibility. That's a hard one for us today, especially in a world where we make excuses and we blame someone else and we never take responsibility ourselves. We as believers need to embrace that more and 
and take responsibility for our own actions. We have to make the choice to receive Christ Jesus personally. We can't let our parents be the ones that receive the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart. You have to make that choice. In raising my my sons, I made that so clear to them that it was up to them. They needed to make that choice. They needed to make that decision. I didn't really care what they did for a living. You know, and, and I was clear with them. I don't care if you're an astronaut or if you're working in a warehouse, you know, and you're a janitor or whatever. It doesn't matter. What matters is, is that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and that when I get to heaven and I'm waiting for you on the other side of those gates, that you walk through those gates. That's what really matters. Take personal responsibility for your own actions, for your own sins. Don't blame anybody else. A sense of personal responsibility. And then last, uh, John was different in that he was baptizing people. In a sense, washing them. Uh, Recognized spiritually that the old man needed to be washed and a new man needed to come forth. And so he's calling them to repentance. The word repentance is interesting. It means to change one's mind. To change one's mind for better, heartedly to amend with abhorrence abhorrence of one's past sins and so recognizing that what you've done is you've sinned and you're willing to repair that sin by doing whatever it takes to restore that relationship that you have broken but it also includes attitude that's important just doing the action is not enough I remember growing up, my, my father was trying to teach me how to say, I'm sorry. You know how hard that is for a kid, especially for a male kid to say, I'm sorry. And so he would once in a while get me and tell me, go tell your brother you're sorry. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. Just go tell him you're sorry. And so I'd go over and I'd look at him. Oh, I'm sorry. It's like, what? What'd you say? I said, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, what is so hard about saying that? Well, eventually you get good. And you just say, I'm sorry, but you really don't mean it. There's The attitude is not there that you are sorry. I had gotten into a fight one time in high school over Virginia. I mean, this guy went head to head. We were at the at, at our PE class, and we were right by the, the gym doors, and so we were throwing blows, and somehow he pushed me up against uh, a piece of metal, and I cut my, my eye. Blood was just all over the place, and he had offended me. He had v- offended my wife, Virginia. Well, not, not then my wife, but now my wife. <clears throat> uh, and so I, we went head, head to head, and they, they um, suspended us for three days. And after three days, they brought us into the office, and they said, you guys need to apologize to one another. And I said, I ain't apologizing to him. He offended my girlfriend, and he offended me, and there's no way that I'm ever going to apologize to him. And the principal says, you need to apologize. And the guy just looked down and said, I'm sorry. And then we walked out of the place. You know, I just wouldn't do it. It's just something that's hard to do. But it has to be with attitude, with attitude. Yeah, really from the heart. And it wasn't until I met Jesus Christ that I realized I need to really repent from my sins with the heart. And boy, did he break me. And when I repented, God did a, a great work in my lives. A word study reveals that it's a word compound of the preposition after or with and the verb to perceive or to think as a result of perceiving and observing the situation where you're focused on what you have done and you perceive and you're observing something with the heart. In this compound, the preposition combines the two meanings of time and change, which may may denote by after and different so that the Whole compound means to think differently after. So saying all that, to say to think differently after than what you thought before. To change your mind. So repentance is therefore primarily a afterthought, a difference from a former thought, than to change a mind with the issue in regret and in change of conduct. And so not just to say, I'm sorry, but from that point on, begin to live it out. Forget about it and move on in, in that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a decision which changes the total direction of one's life completely. 
a Lutheran church in Pittsburgh was established in a ministry called the Listening Ear. And so what they would do is they would allow parishioners to call the ministers on the phone and confess their sins. And so the minister would take uh, many calls, but he would really never respond to their confessions. He would just listen. And once they got it all off their chest, they would just hang up the phone. That's not true repentance. That is more like just taking the weight off of myself so I don't have to deal with the guilt any longer. Paul is clear what repentance is in 2 Corinthians 7.10. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. It produces death. Just to be sorry is not enough. Godly sorrow says, I have offended, I have done something wrong, I have missed God's mark and I need to correct this. I need to change something. I need to agree with God and then I need to make uh, amends with that individual. And repentance is a central message in the Christian faith too. Jesus continued the teaching of, of John the Baptist here with repentance. Matthew 4, Jesus begins preaching and he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So it's a command and it's required for our salvation in Jesus Christ. And if you repent, then you won't suffer the consequences that await those that do not repent. Even Jesus himself talked about Nineveh, who will come and judge this generation because when Jonah went to them, they repented from their sins and a great revival took place in Nineveh. And yet in his town, while doing miracles, they would not turn from their sins. Even uh, the 12 disciples began to preach the message of repentance uh, from their sins. If you repent, there is joy in heaven, the Bible says. Luke 15.10, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents from their sins. And more importantly, when someone repents, uh, there is a sense of, of joy in God himself because a sinner has returned unto the Lord, then joy from believers producing works unto salvation. The Lord looks at that lost soul as more important, that one compared to the 99 than anyone else because that one soul was destined for separation for eternity. So, that brings up an interesting question and you probably are thinking about it at, at this moment. Well, as a believer, do I repent or do I confess? Well, if you go to Revelation and you look at the churches, the seven churches, God is telling them to repent and to turn from what they're doing. But yet, when you look at the gospel messages of Jesus Christ and especially the Apostle John, he talks about confession. And so there is a sense where repentance to a non-believer is essential for their salvation. They need to agree with God that they've sinned, and then they need to stop that sinning, and they need to accept God's way and change their life for the better. And God then welcomes them into eternal life. But then as we walk as believers, we stumble, we fall short, we, we nitpick, <laughs> you know, we criticize and so forth, and that's when we confess on a daily basis. Uh, Peter preaching the same message as John and Jesus about uh, repentance and confession. Let me quickly define the kingdom of heaven. It is a kingdom of heaven because its origin, its place, which is in the heavenly, it's separate from this world. It's also the kingdom of heaven because of its end. It's the eternal state that we all eventually will be at and because of its king, that is Jesus himself. And so the kingdom of heaven that John is talking about is speaking of Jesus himself in his kingdom and in the end this will take place. So change your attitude and direction for Jesus has come and who has come and who is returning very soon. And then John goes on in verse 3, For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And so Matthew then says this is a fulfillment of Scripture. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. This is the man, John. He is the one who is out there in the wilderness and he's a voice of one crying to prepare the way to make straight the path for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
a cry to a world lost in the wilderness. During this time, Israel was in, in a dryness. It's been over 400 years since a prophet had been introduced to them. And so they have lived in dryness without the presence of God in a sense. And then all of a sudden, John the Baptist shows up and he begins to preach a message of repentance, preparing the way for the Lord. And so as John prepares this way, he fulfills what Isaiah said would happen in chapter 40, verse 3. You know, we are to plant seeds and we are to water the gospel message as believers. We are to be, in a sense, little evangelists. And I'm not saying that you need to go out on a street corner. I'm not saying you need to go door to door. What I'm saying is that we need to live our lives before people so that they see Jesus in us. And there's there's, there's a sense where they will desire and want to know what you have because they see the peace and the joy in your life. They see something different about you than they see about others. That's how we should live. And we can proclaim that to the world, whether we plant seeds, whether we water, and then the Lord gives the increase. I used to have a ministry years ago. We called it Pleaders for Christ. It came from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, 17 through 21. In verse 20, it says this, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. Now you can just imagine the words there and the thought that Paul was trying to convey to them. We're ambassadors. We're ambassadors for Christ. Now you know what an ambassador is. If we have an embassy in, a, in another state or another nation... It's usually a building of some sort there where Americans live and dwell. Well, according to the law, and it's supposed to be this way, but it isn't uh, today, but according to the law, that piece of property should be like living here in the United States. That as though the United States is there. And so when when another nation comes in, it's like they're entering in the United States, though they haven't left their own nation. And in that, na- in that place, they have an ambassador who represents the United States. Now, we know what, what happened there in Benghazi when they came in and just wiped them all out and said, forget it, we don't care. We don't care if that's soil of the United States. We're going in there and we just killed everybody. And we know that there's a, a big cover-up in that whole situation politically. We are ambassadors, and in a sense, they've done the same thing to the ambassadors, the apostles, right? We don't care if you're an ambassador. Peter was crucified upside down. Uh, Others were were killed and martyred in various means and ways. So we are ambassadors of Christ as though Christ were pleading through us. We know what pleading is. If you're a teenager, you know what pleading is. You know, please, please, can I, can I, can I? I promise, I promise, I promise. You know, if you just let me, let me, let me. That type of pleading. Have you ever pleaded with someone? Just heard a story at a conference we went to last week, and it just has stuck with me because it's so true. Uh, This pastor who was teaching, he was talking about his father, and his his father was uh, part of the the Bible college. I saw some, uh, it works for him. So it was him, I can't remember, David something. Yeah, David Shirley. He was talking about his his father. He came from a a Christian family, and his father was always sharing the gospel message. And he said that his father had, uh, had witnessed to a friend of his, uh, and the friend didn't respond, so he went home, and that night he said he had a dream. And he had a dream of escalators, uh, one, one going up and one going down. And he said that, that he was at the one escalator going up, and the other guy was at the escalator going down. And, and, and they were kind of at the beginning, and the guy shouted to him and said, Hey, why didn't you tell me? The guy's thinking, well, I did tell you. I, I just told you about Jesus, you know. And as they're getting closer and closer, and they're about halfway, and they're looking at each other, the guy's screaming at him, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you really tell me? And the guy's going, but I did tell you. I just shared, I laid it all out for you, you know. And they're getting farther and farther apart. And at the very end, the guy's screaming, why didn't you tell me? And he just woke up like, what is this dream about? He didn't realize that God was ministering to him about something more than just telling and he said he caught, kept thinking about it and thinking about it. And finally the Lord said, you need to tell him as though you really believe it's going to happen. And so he took that dream and he went back to the guy and he told him like it was really going to happen. And the guy accepted the Lord, including his whole family. Is there a difference? Yeah. 
You can say it, you know, as though you believe it or not, or you can say it like you do believe it. And and if a person doesn't receive Christ, then they're going to hell. I remember um, my boys were friends with a neighborhood kid. She was a female. And we were very watchful over our boys. We would not allow them to go over to other people's houses. They always played at our house so that we could watch them because kids have a tendency of getting into trouble and doing things. Um, And as a parent, you need to believe that because if you don't, then you're going to harm your child more than anything else. I'm dealing with a situation right now where a young man had done all kinds of sexual things to a little girl. And when the father was confronted with it, he just, oh, no, not my son. He would never do anything like that. My son's perfect. And now it's in the courts because the young man admitted to it all. And that's sad when a parent does that. And so we were very watchful for over our boys. And this family came over, the, the mother, and said, hey, why won't you let your boys come over to our house? And so... Um, we says, well, this is why. And she says, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, could we talk with you? Could you and Virginia come over to our house? Sure. So we went over there and they had their daughter because they wanted their daughter to listen to the whole thing. And so, so we shared with them why we would not allow our boys to go over there. And then we turned, I turned it around to sharing the gospel with them. I turned it from the focus on their relationship with, to the focus of Christ. And by the time we were done, the whole family kneeled down on the ground and accepted the Lord Jesus Christ into their hearts. See, looking for opportunities like that to share the message, the message that means so much to you that you're willing to take steps of faith like that. And from what I understand, uh, that family uh, started uh, going to harvest and they were involved and then they had moved on and they were actually in a ministry of some sort. And that's why it's worth it when you preach the gospel message. Pleading pleading with them, imploring on Christ's behalf that they get right with God. <clears throat> now let me clarify something here that I think is important because we can miss this if we're not really thinking about it. John isn't preaching a message of religion. He, he doesn't have a book. Okay, you need to follow all these rules. He's not preaching a, a, a faith. Okay, this is what I believe. This is what I see. This is what I feel. You know, he's not preaching that at all. He is preaching about a man, Jesus Christ. A relative, you, know, you can really think about it, it's a relative of his that he grew up with. He's preaching a message about a man, a human being who was born to Mary. And he's preparing a way for the man, Jesus himself. Not a faith, not a religion. He's talking about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. This is wonderful, and it reveals the truth to us about God and His heart and what He wants us to do. But it also reveals to us Jesus Christ, personally, the man. That is the person that we are to have a relationship with. Not Calvary Chapel, but Calvary Chapel, they teach through the word and they're so wonderful. Yeah, I know that. I love Calvary Chapel. I'd never be nothing else. And that's where I was saved and that's where I was trained and, and I will die that way because I believe that it is a non-denominational church that's separate from anyone else and it's, it, it's biblically run as I believe scripture says and it focuses on the man Jesus Christ. I understand that. But I'm not here to say Calvary Chapel's the way. No, Jesus is the way. It's the man Christ himself that we need to have a relationship with. And Jesus is that person. Jesus is God. Jesus came in the flesh. He was fully man. Fully man. He had all the same temptations, all the same feelings. He laughed. He giggled. You know, uh, he, he got angry, but he did not sin. And yet he was God completely, so that he was the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. He was perfect in every sense of the word. He was the, he was the, the perfect child, he was a perfect teenager, he was a perfect man in every sense. He had all the emotions and all the feelings as a human being, but he did not sin, so that he could die on the cross for us. 
Let me prove this to you. When you look at 1 John chapter 1, this is what the Apostle John said. Now we, we heard what, what, Jesus, what John is saying here, the, the Baptist, about Jesus Christ, but listen to what John said about Jesus Christ. Uh, 1 John 1.1 1, 1, We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning. So that's his eternal state. It's proving that he's God. Whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. Are they talking about a religious system of faith, of belief? No. They're talking about a man, Jesus Christ. This is the guy who we've seen, we touched and we heard and we proclaim him to you. Have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now Paul in Hebrews chapter 1 he says as long ago God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these last days or final days, he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance. And through the son, he created the universe. In past, God spoke through the prophets concerning God's will and direction. But today, he speaks through the Son. The Son is the central theme. It is the center of our faith in our Christianity. It is our relationship with the Son that matters more than anything else. And so you go to John chapter 14, and Jesus says to his disciples in the upper room, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He didn't say the Torah. He didn't say the Bible that's coming up in the near future. No, he said, believe in me. And then he drops to verse 6, and Jesus said, because I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Very clear. And so the central theme of Christianity is Jesus himself. We are not to have a relationship with the Word of God, this Word. We're not to have a faith based upon rules and regulations. We're to have a relationship with God himself. Jesus Christ. Now that does, and I don't want to mislead you, that does encompass the Word of God. That as we're uh, having this relationship with Jesus Himself, then we're also learning about Him through the Word of God because He said, the things that you've read in the Scriptures, they all speak of me. And so how do we cultivate that relationship with Jesus Christ? First we realize that He is an individual. He's, He's a man. He's God in the flesh. And he wants to have a relationship, just like we all want to have relationships here on this earth. Now, he said that, he, that you believe in God, but you also need to believe in me, Jesus Christ. But not only do you have to believe in Jesus Christ, you also have to believe that God has a church, a body of believers. And you need to believe that we are all children of God. And so when you believe in the Father, you believe in the Son, you also have to believe in what God is doing in the lives of believers too. It all works together. It all works together just like the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father leads and guides. The Son obeys the Father. And it is the Holy Spirit that gives power and glory to Jesus Christ. Have a personal relationship with Jesus. I love my wife. I know my wife. I don't have a book that tells me about her. You know, I don't have to go and read something. I don't have to think and meditate on her. I can see her personally. I can touch and I can hold her because I have a personal relationship with her. And that's the type of relationship Jesus wants to have with us. Let me close. Someone said, John came like the morning star is seen before the sun rises. And boy, did he. He was a forerunner of Jesus Christ, not only in ministry and in a message, but also in his death. Think about that. John started his ministry and he gave his message and he also died for it. And so he prepared the way of Jesus to begin his ministry, his message, and his death and resurrection. John was a preacher. He was a hurdler of God's word. It was Richard Baxter that said, I preach as never sure to preach again and as a dying man to dying men. That's how we have to view it. We're preaching the message of the gospel as though we never preached it before. I don't know if you're a dying man or woman here today. 
If you are, then you have the opportunity to repent. Because John will go on and preach that, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world is here. And if you believe in Him, you will have eternal life. 1 John 1, 3 says, That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about a religion. I'm not talking about a belief system. I'm talking about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If you do not, you need to this morning. Revelation says, I stand. You know this, Revelation 3.20. Jesus says, very good. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Again, Jesus will come into you. He's standing and knocking at your heart. If you open the door, he'll come in and dine with you. Let's bow our heads. Father, I don't know the heart of your people, Lord. I don't know where they're at. I don't know what they believe in, Lord. But your message was clear today that they need to believe in the person of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who's realized that they've been believing in a faith, They've been believing in something that their parents have told them. If they've been believing in, in, in some church, it's been wrong. They need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want to give them that opportunity this morning, Lord, that they would just give their heart to Jesus and invite him in. If you want that relationship with Jesus Christ, I want you just to raise your hand. Thank you, Lord. Anyone else? You want Jesus and Jesus only. Nothing else but Him. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. Let's all pray this. Lord Jesus, please come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. Please forgive my sins and give me the gift of eternal life. Father, we thank You, Lord, for our salvation. We thank You, Lord, that Jesus paved the way for us, Lord. And believing in His work, What he had done on the cross, Lord, allows us, gives us the right, Lord, to be his children, Lord. I pray for these two, Lord, that have accepted Christ into their hearts and nothing else, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and begin the process of sanctification. Lord, cause them to be born again, Lord. Cause them, Lord, to see things differently, Lord. Give them hunger for you, Lord. Give them a desire, Lord, to please Jesus and Jesus alone, Lord. In his name we pray, amen.